Hi, everyone. Um, so my name is Lois, and I'm the Deep Tech Pioneers Manager here at Hell Tomorrow. Welcome and good morning, good afternoon, wherever you're connecting from. Um, so thank you for joining this Ask Me Anything session. As you know, it's dedicated to the Global Challenge and to helping you uh, get all the information you need from the timeline, the criteria, and what value it can bring to you. And today, I'm really happy because we have a special guest. We have Brent Cutliff, who is the co-founder and COO at New Iridium. And uh, some of you may know New Iridium is uh, one of our winners from last year. So hi, Brent. How are you doing? Hi, hi Lois. Thank you very much. I'm happy to be here. Thank you. Thanks for, for joining us. And I'm sure the startups are eager to hear um, what your experience was like and, and, and what you have to say for, for everything through all the, the experience that you had with the challenge. Um, but I'll start with the presentation of the challenge first, and then I'll let you speak a little bit about who you are and, and what your experience was. And at the end, of course, we'll have enough time for uh, questions uh, from the audience that they can ask to me about the challenge generally or to yourself about your specific experience. Um, but just a few Sounds housekeeping good. roles um, to start with. So of course you don't need to wait until the Q&A to interact with myself or with Brent. Um, on the right hand panel of your screen, you can click on the bottom right and you'll see a me message tab where you can chat with each other, with us. Um, you can always let us know where you're connecting from so we know where where you're where you're based and and where, um, yeah what your startup is doing uh, you can always say hello on that tab uh, there's also a question tab so here you can specifically ask your questions to myself or to Brent and you'll also be able to upvote those questions that you think are most relevant this will be helpful for me because when I go through the questions later um, I can pick the ones with the highest post parts and then continue with the rest um, so that's pretty much it I'll get started with the presentation of the challenge. Um, so let's dive right in. So for us, the Hello Tomorrow Global Challenge has been going on since 2014, and this is actually the ninth year of this competition. And the goal has always been the same. Um, it was founded by two co-founders who were actually very passionate and themselves in the scientific fields and wanted to promote deep tech solutions. And um, because of that, uh, they created the Hello Tomorrow uh, Global Challenge. And this, uh, the idea behind is really to support early stage deep tech startups that are developing solutions that can actually solve uh, the big problems that we're dealing with today. So by early stage deep tech startups, who do we actually mean? Um, you have on the screen some information that can help answer that question. First of all, um, we do look at the innovation of your technology. So whether it is a product or a service, it should be a new technology or based on a scientific discovery or a complex engineering process. Um, so really we're covering deep tech here. Um, we do cover all industries and technologies. So wherever you're coming from, as long as it's to deep tech solution, you should find yourself within the 10 categories that are listed on the right hand of the screen. So it goes from aerospace to environment, to healthcare, and it's yeah, really open to anywhere uh, anybody working in deep tech. Uh, the second criteria is that you should be working in the early stages. Um, so for us, we look at projects that are just spinning out of university up to projects that are, or startups that have had a uh, maximum series A round. So if you're you know, just looking for your first clients, um, your first investors, then this is a really good fit for your startup. Lastly, um, I mentioned it before, so you're looking for startups that want to have impact. Um, on the yeah, different aspects. So that can be in the environment, on society, on industry. Um, so it doesn't have to be very large scale, but something that is looking for impact at a broad, a pretty broad uh, part of society. Um, a quick note on the timeline. So as you know, the applications are now open and will remain open until September, end of September. Um, but it's always good to get started early. Um, you'll see the application is quite comprehensive. So it's nice to just have a look first, get to know the questions that we're asking and, and have time to, to really go through them um, before the deadline in September. And once the applications close, um, then we get into the evaluation phase. Um, so first we review the big batch of selection of startups that apply. And then out of those, we select in the first round startups who we call our deep tech pioneers. Um, so deep tech pioneers, essentially, these are the startups that have fulfilled our, the criteria that we've set out and that have been considered by our jury as the best ones in their categories. So it really depends um, on the quality, but every year we select about 700 startups to join our deep tech pioneers and be part of our community. 
And these Deep Tech Pioneers also get access to our events that you see on the screen, so the Investor Day and the Global Summit. Um, then following the selection of the Deep Tech Pioneers, we have the second round of evaluations. Um, out of those Deep Tech Pioneers, we select the finalists. And these are announced in January. So there will be about 70-ish of them um, that are announced and that then get to pitch at the Global Summit on, in March. Um, so all the, the, the finalists and the Deep Tech Pioneers are inv invited to the Investor Day and the Global Summit that takes place in March. And of course, um, they get, um, they get access to different other opportunities throughout these two days, which I'll elaborate on more in the next few slides. So why apply to the challenge? Um, well, it really goes back to us wanting to support early stage startups. And so we wanted to focus on the needs of uh, startups at, uh, at the very early stages. So we know that they need connections. We know they need visibility at the very first steps. And we also know that they need funding. More specifically, I'll go into each um, aspect. So one of the main things we offer are connections. Um, and this is connections within a really relevant network that is very much focused on deep tech. And in this network, we have a mix of stakeholders that are relevant for startups, including investors, large companies. We also have fellow deep tech startups. So you'll be able to have a chance to connect with them whether that's throughout the year, because we do have the Deep Tech Pioneers community, which is ongoing, or through attending our global summit. Um, and hopefully those will lead you to some business and funding opportunities. Sometimes it can even lead you to finding your key team members. This has happened to one of the previous um, startups that have been selected through a challenge who found their CEO at the summit. Um, and of course, if you're also selected as a winner, we do help you uh, in kind. Uh, with some kind of personalized one-to-one -one coaching and some personal introductions as well if you need them with investors, partners, or clients. Um, so this is something that we know is really important and we do prioritize that in the Global Challenge. A second aspect that we look into and that we prioritize is also the global uh, is visibility on a global level. Um, as a deep tech pioneer, you do get this label, which means that you've been recognized by us as a startup who is at the top of your industry at an international scale. So this is a label that most of the people in our ecosystem know to this point. Um, then during the Global Summit, as I mentioned before, there are many opportunities to be visible, whether that's on stage or in the various spaces that we have. Uh, the selected finalists get to pitch on stage um, and it's with a really big audience of about 400 people all working within deep tech. And at the same time, even if you're not a finalist, you still have the chance to demo your solution in our space. So we have a very dedicated exhibition area where you can bring your prototypes and show what you've been working on to the attendees. And of course, we also have a lot of media that is attending. Um, so there's a lot of opportunities really to get visibility, not just at the event, but afterwards as well with interviews with this media. So just a quick look at some of the numbers. Um, this, is, uh, this is the breakdown of the attendees that attend our global summit. Um, as I mentioned, it will be this March, so 21st and 22nd, and it is a flagship event that we've been hosting since the very beginning of Hello Tomorrow. And it's a way where we not only bring value to the DT pioneers that have been selected through our global challenge, but also to bring together the rest of the ecosystem and just uh, generate new ideas, um, inspire each other, and generate business as well. Finally, of course, it wouldn't be complete uh, to have a competition without some kind of financial perks. Um, so we don't take any equity from the startups that participated. We do have uh, winning prices, and they're all uh, equity-free, and we have three of them. So 100K for the grand prize, 30K for the second prize, and 20K for the third prize. But even if you don't win, uh, you'll still have a lot of access to funding opportunities throughout the year or during our investor day. So at our investor day, I'll show you a bit more about that. But it's a day dedicated really to one to one meetings with special VCs and CVCs that are working in deep tech. And throughout the year, we also give you the opportunity to let us know whenever you're fundraising and we'll advertise that within our deep tech investor network. 
Um, so this is the investor that I was mentioning. So this happens the day before the global summit. So on March 20th um, next year. And these are just some examples of the investors that have attended. And they're there specifically to meet one-to-one -one with startups that have been selected through our network. Um, so the reason why we're able, even able to have a, an event like this is because we actually work all year long to create a very active inter, um, investor network. Um, we have about 700 that are in our network today, and we send them uh, news from our startups, fundraising opportunities from our startups every month. And this is why they're able to see the value of our community and come to our events every year. Oops. Um, so I don't know if there's already some questions, but do feel free again to, to go through the, uh, the questions tab and ask any questions that you might have. Um, before we go to Brent uh, and, and hear about his experience, I'll go over this part, which is, I think, important, and we can go deeper into the Q&A. Um, so we do, of course, have selection criteria. This is how we pick the startups that are joining our, our Deep Tech Pioneers community and also those that are selected to become finalists later on. Um, so really, first of all, the main, the baseline, I think, is to make sure that you realize that we only are able to evaluate startup, uh, your startup based on what you submit on the application. Um, so that's the main thing that I'd like to stress is that you make sure that it's as complete as you can make it. Um, we don't do any additional forms or interviews before we select the finalists. So everything that you would like to add within the application to showcase your technology and the traction that you've had so far will be important. And so the four criteria you see here, so technological innovation, impact, economic viability, and team are the four criteria on which we um, evaluate the startups, are the criteria on which we evaluate the startups, and they're all weighted equally, so they're all equally important. First, um, as it is a deep tech competition, we do look at the technological innovation. Um, so this means we're not just looking for a business innovation, but we're really seeing how your solution is disruptive. Um, how, is, how is it bringing value to what currently exists? Um, so of course, to demonstrate this, you can have a nice complete description of your technology, but that alone isn't enough. Uh, we would also need some kind of external proof of how novel and realistic it is. So some examples of this could be any patents you have, any publications that you might have, KPIs and anything else to prove that there's been someone externally or a different body that's been uh, approving and, and uh, that has validated your technology to some degree. The second criteria we look at as well is impact. Uh, I already mentioned this a couple of times before, but it's really important to stress that we want to see that your technology has a positive impact on the industry you're working in or on society as a whole. So it doesn't have to be necessarily, um, you know, at a global level, but it should be large enough. So covering enough of the population that, that you're targeting or the industry that you're targeting. A third thing that we also look at is, of course, your uh, startup's economic viability. Um, so what do we want to see here? Well, essentially, we're looking to see that the, that you realize um, that you already know which market you'd like to target and that this market is sufficiently large. Um, so with that, of course, comes uh, a convincing and relevant business model to back the to back your to back your economic viability. And we also want to see that you have seen who your competitors are and that you know what your what advantage you have over these competitors. Obviously, this really depends on your maturity. So if you're just spinning out of university, you might not have a very in-depth um, business model uh, planned already. But it's really important, even if you're not commercializing yet, that, you know, you've, uh, that we see that you've thought through this process and have an initial plan uh, to move forward and that you know which markets are the best for you to target in the initial phases. And lastly, of course, we look at the makeup of your team. So first of all, there needs to be a minimum of two people to be eligible. And then on the application, we do ask for some additional information about your team members, your founders, um, just to understand what the expertise is, but what expertise is available within your team. So we want to see, of course, that there is a balance between the scientific or technical um, expertise and also a bit of industry and business knowledge. Um, so obviously, this can come from the actual team members that are working operationally, but for industry and business expertise, it can also come from advisors or other external people who are helping you. So as long as you have, you know, those two aspects uh, represented, it's really a good indicator for us um, that this will be a startup that can grow in the future. 
Um, so those are just the few criteria and we can go more in detail in the Q&A, but it's what you'll want to keep in mind as you complete the application to make sure you're, you're preparing a potentially winning one. So I'll move on to the key part as well of this presentation, which is hearing from Brent about his experience. Thanks, Lois, and uh, good morning. Well, good afternoon, everybody in, in Europe, and uh, morning if those are signing in from America. Uh, so, uh, my name is Brent Cutcliffe. I'm the co founder, chief operating officer at New Iridium. Um, I bring the business expertise to the company. My two technical co founders are, are pioneers in photocatalysis. I'll talk more about that. Uh, and uh, world-renowned experts in the development of photocatalysts, which are the, the key enabler. So in a nutshell, what we're doing is decarbonizing the chemical industry. And uh, we're, we're choosing applications where we can have gigaton scale impact. And just to put that in perspective, uh, rough figures are, are that uh, there's roughly 50 gigatons a year of man-made emissions going into the atmosphere. Uh, and so you can see if you can make an impact at gigaton scale, it is, uh, it is significant. So our beachhead application is acetic acid from corn ethanol. I, I'll also speak a little bit more about that as we, as we go through. So moving to the next <coughs> uh, slide, our technology is photocatalysis and it's revolutionary in that it uses light to drive chemical reactions instead of heat. And uh, with photocatalysis, you get two, two big benefits that come from the technology. The first is that reactions happen at room temperature as opposed to high heat. Um, many of those in the chemical industry are you know, upwards of 1,000 degrees C. And the other big benefit <clears throat> is that you can do uh, what's called new chemistry. In other words, you can combine molecules in ways that haven't been done before. And in so doing, you can make uh, products uh, sometimes using fewer processing steps than the incumbent technology, and sometimes using a lower cost or a lower carbon foot uh, feedstock. So feedstock in chemical engineering, uh, just think of that as raw materials uh, in, in lay language. So what we have done is picked applications <coughs> that derive from our platform where we can have a significant economic impact as well as um, uh, emissions impact. And so you can see here, um, our, our markets address a TAM of about 340 billion, which is a, a pretty big number. So to achieve the, the uh, carbon impact, uh, number one, we're decarbonizing the largest scale olefin processes. And olefins are part of the petrochemical uh, uh, supply chain and they're the, the biggest chemical process on the planet. They underpin all of the plastic products that you see today. Uh, so that's, uh, that's our biggest application. Other applications uh, use corn ethanol. I'll speak a little bit more about that. And uh, another one uses CO2 as a feedstock. So here, uh, we're not only you know, minimizing emissions from the process itself, but we're also utilizing CO2 uh, and abating CO2 that goes into the product. And our technology is protected by two layers of patents, one at the photocatalyst level, again, that's the key enabler, and the other level is at the, the, for the chemical process itself, and you can think of that as the, uh, uh, the recipe. So a little bit about our, our, <clears throat> our beachhead application, acetic acid from corn ethanol and air. The top piece is just a, a chemical diagram. I'm, I'm not gonna go through that in detail. I think it's uh, somewhat self-explanatory. So this particular product addresses uh, a market of about 15 billion. Uh, it's commonly known as vinegar, uh, but it's produced industrially and used in paints and adhesives. For our value proposition with this product, uh, we can produce a plant-based product at cost parity with the incumbent. So plant-based, meaning it's renewable, bio-based. Uh, and this particular application will abate about 40 million tons of CO2 per year. That's equivalent to removing about 9 million cars from the road. And lastly, uh, the notion of using corn ethanol uh, is that we can repurpose uh, this product that's normally in the United States used for fuel. And we're repurposing it for chemicals. 
And if you think about the growing adoption of electric vehicles, as time goes on, there's going to be less and less demand for, uh, for internal combustion engine fuel, especially in the US uh, that comes from corn ethanol. So there are <coughs> projecting uh, surpluses of corn ethanol going into the future. And the last piece that I'll cover today is a, a, another application. Uh, this one showing uh, use from, from CO2. MMA stands for methyl methacrylate. It's a, a product that you would use in uh, electronic display screens. So your, your cell phones, your laptops, uh, all of the screen technology derives from MMA. It's a $20 billion market. Uh, this particular application consumes about 50% of its uh, weight in CO2. Uh, and here, we can actually start with a, a lower cost feedstock, which drives about a 32% uh, reduction in overall cost. And just to give you a sense, in commodity chemicals, the feedstocks or raw materials account for about 70% of OPEX. And so if you can swap out uh, a feedstock to something lower cost, you're impacting the biggest cost driver of that chemical. And uh, additionally, with this application, we can reduce the number of processing steps from five down to two. Uh, so I will uh, stop my presentation of the company at this point. And uh, Lois, am I to speak now about the my experience? Uh, yeah, definitely. We'd, I'm sure, sure the, the audience would love to hear that. Okay. So I'm going to go back to uh, the beginning uh, in terms of my experience and start with the application process. Lois mentioned this before. Uh, she used the word comprehensive, I believe, and I would, I would agree with that. Um, and I would also agree with her advice to, you know, read it over as soon as you can to get a sense of what questions are being asked and make sure you give yourself enough time to prepare, you know, an adequate answer. Oftentimes, we've, we've applied to a number of different uh, uh, programs over the past couple of years. And while the questions uh, have a, a large degree of overlap, there's always some nuance in the response. And you can kind of get a sense from reading things in, in the totality of where they're going with any individual question. Uh, and, and so I guess what I'm saying is it's, uh, it, it's a rare application where we can just sort of use a cookie cutter approach we always seem to be customizing our response uh, to some degree to fit the application. So make sure you give yourself time for that. And the other bit of advice I would uh, give at this point is uh, read the question carefully. Many times um, they will give clues as to, you know, what the content of the response is expected to be or a key piece of the response uh, based on the question itself. So pay attention to how things are worded. Uh, and I think that makes a difference. Mm -hmm. uh, so moving forward then, uh, the travel piece last year was a little bit complicated by the, the strikes in Paris. Mm -hmm. Hopefully that will be resolved before <laughs> next time. Um, but uh, the, you know, the advice and the, uh, uh, the recommendations that came from Hello Tomorrow concerning hotels and, and you know, Proximity to the venue were all fantastic. We had a terrific experience. Uh, we were within walking distance of the venue, which made things, you know, extremely convenient. Weather in March uh, isn't always, you know, great, but it's it's not bad either. Um, the venue itself, uh, probably smaller than what we would use in the U.S. for a venue of the same number of participants. Uh, so. Uh, for, for Americans, it felt crowded, but the flip side of that is that uh, you bumped into people all the time. And so it really uh, augmented the networking effect uh, of the program. And, and that, you know, that's a, that's a real benefit at the end of the day. We did participate in Investor Day, and I would suggest that any of you who have that opportunity do so. Uh, it takes a bit of preparation in terms of sending out invites and then managing responses to those invites. Um, and I think you really have to uh, get going in high gear on that about a week before the event starts. So again, uh, you know, it's, it's time management planning uh, to get uh, the best impact out of it. Um, so Investor Day, uh, we, had, we were part of the uh, program to pitch. 
so I believe it, it's a three minute pitch to pitch during the track, which isn't a lot of time. You really have to, uh, you know, take the scalpel out to your, your <laughs> investor pitch and, and pare it down. Uh, but again, I think you get good, uh, good advice. And, and I believe, Lois, the rubric for judging the pitch is very mm -hmm. similar to what you talked about, uh, uh, evaluating the applications with the four areas, the technical innovation, the impact, the economic viability, and the team. Yes. And so, mm -hmm. Yeah. So in the three minutes, uh, I think the key is to focus on the proof points uh, for each of those sections. And you really don't have time for much more than that. Uh, so then if you do get selected for the finals, now you're giving a one minute pitch, which uh, is really difficult and it's on the same day. Uh, so you kind of have to prepare in advance for that too. have your one minute. Basically, it's your elevator pitch uh, ready to go and polished. Yeah. And just to maybe clarify that a bit. So essentially, um, as I mentioned, we select 70 finalists who pitch on stage at the summit. So they do have three minutes to pitch uh, and then it's followed by three minute Q&A. So in case there's anything that's unclear or that wasn't um, yeah, touched up on, the, the jury members can ask you questions during the three minutes and you can clarify. Um, and then uh, because we have the 10 different tracks, we do select one winner for each track. So 10 total winners, uh, since we have 10 categories this year, they then get to pitch once more on a bigger stage. So this is 600 people in the audience for only one minute. Um, and the reason for that is because of it's also, you know, part of the award ceremony is a question of timing. Uh, but we do prepare the, the jury members in advance. So they have information about the winners ahead of time uh, so they can properly evaluate uh, the winners and select the top three in the end. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I, I would assess the, you know, the whole event, Investor Day, plus the, the two days of the summit itself, uh, very valuable. Uh, we met lots of investors. I think between VCs and CVCs, we put the number out of about uh, 18 to 20 uh, who we met with. Uh, we're still in dialogue with uh, three of the CVCs. And we have also begun, uh, Lois mentioned earlier, the Startup Catalyst Program. Uh, if you happen to be a track winner, uh, th that's curated intros to VCs that are part of the, uh, the Hello Tomorrow network. So uh, that process with us is just starting up at this point and uh, uh, going very well. We're, we're very much looking forward to the outcomes uh, of that program. So I'll wrap it up there in terms of my description. Of course, we're you know, open for questions at this point and happy to yeah. dialogue. Yeah, I think we have a few questions, so I'll, I'll run through them. Um, let's just see here. So oops, I'll pick the upvoted ones first. So how many people are allowed to pitch on stage during the Hello Tomorrow Challenge? And what is the maximum number of representatives allowed per company? Um, so how many people are allowed to pitch on stage? So this, these are the finalists that we, we select. So there's only about 70 of them. Um, that's about six or seven per track or category. Um, so depending on, on which category you fit in, uh, let's say, yeah, one, we have about six in aerospace, six in, or seven in environment, so different categories. And in total, that makes about 70 finalists that get to pitch on stage. Um, but of course, the other startups that are selected as Deep Tech Pioneers, they still have access to your global summit um, to attend and meet with corporates and other attendees that might be interesting to them. And they also still have access to Investor Day. So there they can have the one to one meetings that Brent was mentioning um, uh, with investors. Um, and in terms of the pitch, so what is the number, the maximum number of representatives on per company? So only one person per team. Um, the three minutes, it goes by really fast, um, as, as Brent mentioned. And so having more than one person, it's not really ideal. Um, and it's, yeah, it's making sure as well that we make the best use of our time and, and, and that we don't go over. Um, so hopefully that answers your question. Um, a few more. So hello. Oh, hi, Timur. So yes, thanks for joining as well this session. Um, so yes, in terms of the fees uh, to attend, we don't cover um, the flight and accommodation uh, we, because we do have about 700 startups that we select as Deep Tech Pioneers. Um, of course, not all of them are able to attend, but a lot of them still do attend in the end. So we're not able to cover all of the travel and accommodation expenses uh, for the startups. However, as it is, um, 
and global challenge that we are trying to promote startups um, that are in the early stages for your first year. Uh, all of the, uh, the fees to attend the event are completely free uh, for the global summit. Um, for the investor day, there is a small fee, but um, compared to the other tickets that we have uh, for external attendees, so it's very, very minimal because uh, again, we do have to keep the balance between being able to host an event that is of good quality and, and be able to um, invite the right investors, have the right venue, have the right, um, yeah, even catering and everything, but also be able to promote the startups that are still in the early stages to attend. Um, so there's a small fee for the investor day, but the global summit for your first year, it is completely free um, and you get access to the full two days. Um, in the application, there's a question um, asking if you're willing to move to France to develop your solution. Why is that? Um, so that's not because we're trying to get you to move to France, although I, I myself uh, uh, quite like my life here having yeah, moved from the US. Um, that's not the reason um, that we ask that. It's really just out of curiosity because we do have uh, partners, a lot of them that are based in France, since this is our, where our HQ is. Um, so because of that, we like to see if this is a potential interest for you. And if it is, then we might, uh, you know, introduce you or connect you with some actors within our ecosystem uh, that might be relevant. So not it won't have any impact at all on your application. Um, there we go. And then we have another one from David. Um, so David from Robotwin, we are teaching industrial robots to move. I was wondering if it is OK if we have public funding to enter the competition. Yes, definitely, that's perfectly fine. We have no limitations on that. Um, in fact, we have a lot of participants that get funding from um, you know, their governments uh, all over the world. So you know, Brent and the new Iridium team, it's new, but they, for instance, got funding recently from the National Science Foundation in the US. No problem at all. In France, we have a lot of startups uh, getting funding as well from BPI France. Um, so this is no limitation to us. And you can have a little bit of funding raised already. Um, so as I, as I mentioned, it's for early stage. But even if you have a bit of funding, we still accept you as long as you have a maximum uh, funding of Series A. So that is not an issue. Other than not adhering to the details of the application, <laughs> are there any common mistakes we can avoid in the process? So maybe Brent has a few other comments on that for the application. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm not so sure. You know, we, we don't get to see the other applications. Um, so I'm not sure what would classify as common mistakes. Um, but, you know, my sense is that if you if you go into it with the mindset of, okay, we've, we've got this uh, corporate material that's been written, we're just gonna copy and paste it in. Uh, I don't think that's a winning strategy. I think you really need to you know, understand first what uh, track you're in uh, and make sure that you are responsive, not only to the track, but to the, the essence of the question itself. And mm -hmm. again, there's a lot of nuance in the way things are asked and in, in the way the details uh, can be presented. Um, and I guess I would just close by saying uh, proof points uh, are, are sort of king in all of this uh, that you really need to hit, um, you know, the, yeah. those, those proof points. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Thanks, Brent, for, for that. I think I'll add a little bit more and, and emphasize on the fact that yes, you definitely shouldn't just copy paste from, um, from another existing application you've submitted. Of course, we have a lot of similar questions. So you can take inspiration from other applications you've done and, and just kind of improve upon it. Um, but don't forget that you, there's always new news that's coming in for your startup, I'm sure. Uh, so you can always add those updates, any new traction, any new information um, that's been happening. Um, that's important as well to show the progress that you've had. Um, and also, it's I think that the application itself, I mean, I've heard it from a few startups in the past uh, that have been organizing the, the Global Challenge, but it's also been a good exercise for some of them to prepare for other applications because us, I mean, our application kind of covers really everything, as I mentioned before, really comprehensive. So it's a moment for you not only to prepare applications that you might have to do in the future, but also to kind of reflect on where you are in your startup and, and put on paper the things you've achieved so far. And yeah, there's even questions for future milestones. It's also another moment for you to step back and say, okay, what do I have planned for the future and, and, and kind of reflect as well. So not just 
completing it for the application's sake, but, but also a good moment for the, the startup to kind of um, have some reflection. Um, all right, I think there's a few more. So we have Piyush, uh, who is asking, if we are applying for Asia Pacific Challenge, can we have a separate application for the Global Challenge as well? Um, so yeah, this is a bit of a technical question. So we do have an Asia Pacific Challenge uh, for those who don't know. Um, and that means that uh, basically anyone who's based in the Asia Pacific region can apply for this challenge. Uh, and this closes on July 24th. Um, and the cool thing is that it's actually just one application to apply for both the APAC and Global Challenge, um, in a sense, because it's it's the same platform we use and we share the information. And it's a great thing so that you don't have to fill out two different forms. I understand that maybe later on, um, Piyush, you might want to update your application for the Global Challenge. This will be possible. But as far as sending two different applications, it's, yeah, it's kind of a logistics question. We're not able to separate them. Um, but we will allow you to update your application if you need it. Um, and let me just go through this. I don't know if, yes, this we've answered. So from Nicholas, do you accept applications from startups which are already in the market generating traction and have corporates as clients? Um, so yes, I think it's, um, it really depends. I would probably need to know a little bit more about uh, your company and where exactly you are. Um, well, we have had people who have applied who are, have already a bit more, you know, are a bit more mature and advanced in the business side. Um, so starting to talk to corporates and having this clients, um, as long as you still are like looking for your early stage funding. Um, the key thing for us is really that we want to be uh, it's the challenge is open to startups that can benefit from it. Um, so we have the criteria of early stage and up to series A uh, to make sure that we're focusing on the early stage. Um, and then if you're within that, then yes, you can definitely apply. And if you think that you can still benefit from the different things we offer, including investor day, the pitching on stage to get more visibility, um, then I definitely encourage you to apply. And yeah, if you have more specific you know, details about that, you can definitely reach out to us as well by email. Um, I think we have quite a lot of questions. Can we have someone from outside of the startup, like an advisor, as a second team member for the challenge, or does both of the members have to be physically present for the pitch? Um, no, not both. You don't need to be physically both present for the pitch. So if you're selected as a finalist, yes, one of you has to be present in Paris um, in March to deliver the pitch. Um, but yeah, no, it's always nice to have a second team member attend the event as well, because as Brent said, you know, you'll have kind of back-to-back -back meetings um, potentially with, with investors or other actors. So it's nice to have two people. Um, and then as far as the second team member, so when we speak about the, the eligibility criteria and we say you need to be at least two people, they do need to be two full-time uh, team members. Um, so it wouldn't, yeah, it wouldn't count to have just an advisor as a second team member. I don't know if you have um, other experience on rent on, on the day of, and if you think it's useful to have like two people from your team attending instead of one. Yeah, we do. And I, I would second your comment that it, it's extremely helpful to have two people there. <laughs> Uh, interactions with investors, even, you know, just general networking. Mm -hmm. um, you end up at the end of a day in such an information overload state uh, that if somebody was able to take notes while the other one was carrying the conversation, it's extremely valuable mm -hmm. uh, to go back later and look at that. And, you know, that, that counts uh, in the context of the investor day, as well as just, you know, the ad hoc networking that happens, mm -hmm. uh, you know, in the, in the concourse itself. Perfect. Yeah, thanks, Brent. Um, so David is asking, is completed IP protection a must to win the competition? Is it enough that if we would have letters of intents from companies from the industry? Um, so again, I think this is really specific to your technology. It's true that um, one of the things that our jury will look at is how do you protect your IP? Um, because it can have implications for you know, how do you, what is your competitive advantage over your competitors? Is it protected enough so that you can um, go further um, with your technology and within the market? I think, I'm not sure if I would say it's a must, but it's, it's definitely important. Um, and I think 
for the most part, a lot of the, the finalists and the winners that we have in the competition have at least a patent pending or are in the process of doing it or already have a patent. Um, I don't know, Brent, if you have have any like comments on that as well, but for from our experience, it's um, the jury members do look at at how you protect your IP a lot. Yeah, I, I think it is a very important uh, factor to consider from a evaluation standpoint and uh, any proof points that you have, uh, you know, in terms of, you know, filing even a non-provisional, I think is important. Mm. Um, so it, it sort of goes in a, uh, a priority order. If the patent's issued, that's better than patent yeah. pending. And that's exactly. a little bit better than provisional filed. Uh, mm. That's a little bit better than uh, we're thinking about filing. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, definitely consider that. Yeah, I couldn't have said it better. Um, but of course, we do have applicants that also apply without a patent, a full patent yet. So just patent pending or provisional. So that can happen. Um, but to go much further, I would agree that it's, it's yeah, would be better to be on the with patent or patent pending side. Um, so Manon is asking, how do you select the finalists out of the 700 pioneers? Is it only based on the application form? Indeed, um, so uh, I mentioned a bit earlier, this is kind of why I stressed for the application form to be as complete as you can make it. Um, it's, yeah, we don't really have as much uh, time and resources to kind of do what, you know, investors do when they do due diligence and do second um, application forms or interviews with the startups. Um, so really only basing our evaluations on the application that you submit. Um, and on that, yeah, we select, based on that, we select the finalists. Um, and just a little, yeah, I'll take the moment to explain how we select the finalists. We have um, expert jury members that help us with this. Um, so it's composed really a mix of investors, um, uh, startups that are like further in, in, their, uh, in their maturity, um, also some corporates that are partners. Um, there are also some accelerators and incubators that, that help to evaluate the startups and select our finalists. Um, Prashanti is asking, if our company is headquartered in the U.S., but we have our main office in India, would we qualify to apply for the APAC challenge? Um, yes, I believe so. Yes. I mean, you can definitely uh, contact us afterwards, Prashanti. Um, we've had this this before. And maybe you can just clarify with me and the APAC team um, uh, yeah, how your team is, is divided. If you work mostly in Asia Pacific or in the U.S., um, I think we can... Um, help answer that question further. Um, and I think, oh no, we do have quite a bit more. <laughs> um, so let me just make sure I'm not missing some. So we have Kennedy who is asking, how deep the tech does the tech have to be for the startups? How do you guys choose among the startups since they are doing different things? Um, so deep tech, uh, yeah, I mean, I think that's really it for us. It's how innovative is the technology? So is it based on a new scientific discovery? Um, is it a kind of really advanced engineering process? Um, this is, yeah, it's a bit vague, but this is what kind of we look at. Of course, it depends within the category. So that's why it's a bit vague. And I can't answer to, um, to all the, the different categories in one sentence. Um, but yeah, one thing we look at, for instance, some some indicators we look at to see if it's something new is, is it something that is patentable or is patent pending? Do you have any publications um, that you or your team have written to back up the research that you've done and how innovative it is? Um, also, any kind of traction that you've had, this can also be a good indicator for us, you know, maybe you winning awards or getting any kind of external recognition. Um, this can also be helpful for us to see if, if it's a new uh, technology, but really it's it's in the technology description part and yeah, any kind of patent publications that you can show, um, this will be how we can determine if it's deep tech enough for, for the competition. Um, and of course, it's also how you compare with, with your competitors within the same space. Um, if you're bringing something new um, or a, a significant improvement to what is already existing. This is also something where we can um, see that that you're yeah fitting the criteria. Um, and so a second part of the question is how do you guys choose among the startups since they're doing different things? So first we do evaluate within the category. So the startups that are within the environment category are all evaluated as a both together and compared within that category. 
um, and same for the other ones. So that's how we're able to first select the finalists, so the tops within each category, and then out of those, um, they also pitch and compete within first their category. So Neoridium was competing with other environmental finalists. And then after that, once they win, this is when we kind of compare them across the board and select the top three winners. Um, so Nicholas is asking, do you accept applications from startups which are already in the, oh no, this one I already answered. <laughs> um, Calvin, if selected to attend, is there a discount? I think I already answered this. So uh, that, yeah, discount on travel, lodging or registration. So discount on travel, we don't really have any existing um, partnerships with, with airlines. Um, it could happen, but uh, yeah, for now, we don't have anything existing to give discounts on, on anything like that. For lodging, this is something we try to look at and we'll do better on as well this year is to kind of make uh, partnerships with nearby accommodation uh, to see if we can get discounts as well for the DTEC pioneers. Um, for registration to the events, uh, as I mentioned, Global Summit is free for first year uh, startups uh, that are selected as DTEC pioneers and investor day, there's a small fee um, that to attend. Um, and I think those are all the questions. I hope I answered everything. Oh, wait, there are a few more. <laughs> Let me just do it by not answered so I can make sure to cover everything. Uh, does the video submission for the form, does it have to be in the pitch deck um, with founders in it or can it be corporate style video with necessarily details covered? Um, so yeah, the the video pitch video. Um, so really, this is up to you. It's it's just great for us to get an, an idea of what your startup does. Um, it can be a kind of yeah corporate style if you have the mechanism or the means to to kind of create that uh, more professional video. But we've also had some where it's, you know someone was just in front of your, their computer and recording their pitch and and you know running their slides. This is also useful. The key thing is that we want to kind of understand better what your startup is doing. Of course, you have the full application form, but the pitch video, which is not obligatory, by the way, but if you'd like to add it, it helps us just to uh, get an overview of what you're doing, and then we can get into the details within the application form. I don't know, Brent, if you had a pitch video in yours. Um, I don't recall I think, anymore. <laughs> I think we did, yeah. uh, but I would have to double check. Yeah we've, yeah, we've applied to so many. There's a quick question on how many applications you Ah. normally get yes how many applications uh, do you usually receive so last year we did receive quite a few we had about 4,000 applications um, and out of those we selected the 700 um, so that's I think great uh, and and maybe also a nice challenge for you so of course that's a lot of applications meaning um, quite a, a lot of competition for you um, but it also means that for a community that we the 700 startups we select are really among the top ones in their fields. Uh, so this is a great um, indicator for investors, for the corporates who are working in, um, and they know that, that the startups we select go through this rigorous evaluation process. Um, so I think that's, yeah, it's it's good and bad, and not bad, but good and, and a good challenge in, in, in both ways. Um, can a company currently in an incubator program apply? Yes, definitely. If you've, you're in an incubator program, really there's no... There's not much uh, limitations on that part. If you're already in an accelerator program, incubator program, if you've raised some funding, if you're working with a few corporate clients or are talking with investors, um, uh, the main, yeah, the main thing again, as I mentioned, is that you shouldn't have more than a Series A, so anything pre-Series B. And um, if you really think that this, that the network we have, the the different um, elements we have at the events can be valuable to you, then I would definitely encourage you to apply. Um, and I think that is it. Sorry, we missed the number of applications. Oh, <laughs> number of applications, I can type it in. So 4,000 applications <laughs> and you select 700. Well, it depends on, on the, the startups, the quality of startups. But last year we did select um, 700 startups out of this 4,000 applications. And there we go. I think I have covered, covered everything. Um, 
yeah, I mean, of course, if you have other questions, um, I will be available. If you have a specific question for Brent, you can send it to me as well. Um, I'll write my email in the address and I'll, I'll ask Brent and forward his answers to you. Um, sure. But yeah, I don't know, Brent, if you had any last minute advice, anything to, to share with the startups that might be interested in, in applying. Yeah, I was I was thinking as as the discussion went on um, that you know today there's a number of opportunities uh, for events like this, and I think you have to be a little bit strategic as to which ones you choose. You, you can't do them all, obviously. Uh, it's even difficult to apply for them all. Um, and so at the end of the day, you know, uh, try to figure out you know what kind of uh, exposure you're after. Uh, how the event will, you know, support your strategic mm -hmm. goals. And for us, you know, we, we kind of saw this event as, you know, the, the biggest deep tech um, conference in Europe uh, every year. And so it was, you know, it was a, it, to be selected to present. It's a big, you know, that's another um, proof point for us. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it made the application process uh, very valuable at the end of the day. So, uh, think about which ones you apply to and, uh, you know, make your decisions accordingly. Yeah, that's, that's really, really great advice. Um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Brent, for, for joining and sharing your experience with everyone sure. here. Um, so again, if, if anyone here has questions, do contact us directly. We're happy to exchange by email. We can also do a really quick call if needed. Um, and just as a reminder that the deadline is at the end of September but um, as Brent and I have already emphasized a few times, it's not ideal to wait until the very last minute. Um, I think it's really great if you can look at it early and then come to us if you have questions so we can help you um, prepare and not really write it, but at least give you tips on how to make sure that you complete it as well as possible. Um, and also, if you don't you know, if you want to keep up with our news and don't want to miss any updates about the Global Challenge or any other things that we're doing at Hello Tomorrow, we do have other activities. Um, I do encourage you to, to subscribe to our newsletter called The Core for Startups. Um, I think you'll receive an email uh, just after this with, with a link to subscribe. Um, we share on there other relevant opportunities like online events, um, maybe some business opportunities from corporates in our network and just, you know, kind of founder steps as well that's, that we, we draft um, from our network. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's about it for me. Thanks, everyone, for, for joining this session. Um, and good luck to everyone on their applications. Yes, good luck. Talk to you soon. Bye, Brent. Yep, so long. Bye, everyone.